as far as I know of, I got to see about 20 different students uh, pray to receive Christ and become Christians. Two of them, yeah, it was great. Two of them were even Mormons. Um, two were a Mormon family, and it was really cool. We stayed up about 30 minutes after one of my messages, just kind of answering some questions, talking with her and her friends and a couple of their leaders. And uh, the next morning, she uh, asked me, she's like, hey, I, I want to be a Christian. And I was like, that's awesome. Let's go talk with your leaders because this is a big thing if you're in the, the Mormon faith. And her leaders called her parents and they said, hey, we are totally in support of this, which is insane um, to me. And so such a cool, cool thing to see God moving like that in the lives of children. This gets me really hyped and excited for the future of our church and what the kids can do even now to really inspire us and to get us excited for being on mission and uh, telling our friends about Jesus. So this morning we're going to focus on something really, really cool, which is the mission of Jesus. Uh, some of you know my family and I moved here about a month ago, moved to Pueblo yeah. to be, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, to plant a church. We're, we're church planters now, uh, which is super exciting. We're going to, start, we're going to try and start a, a new church over in South Pueblo in the Bessemer area. And it is such, it feels like such a massive undertaking and um, an incredible endeavor just beyond anything that I could ever truly do alone. And so I'm excited to know that ultimately I'm, all I'm really doing is partnering with what God already wants to do. I'm not working out of my own strength, right? Um, but I want to share a story before I begin about the first time that I really interacted and experienced the mission of Jesus. Like, what, what is Jesus' mission? What was he wanting to accomplish? Why did he come to earth? And um, this, this goes all the way back to high school. You see, I didn't grow up in the church. I, I didn't, wasn't really Christian. Uh, we, were, we were Catholic just because I was, like, Mexican in Texas, so you're, like, automatically Catholic. And so we went to church on all the important days, you know, Christmas and Easter, uh, but that's about it. And so I had this tendency by the time I became a teenager to, um, to sneak into churches. I just liked going to the big room and just kind of sitting. I would take a nap sometimes. I, don't, I just felt like a really cool place to be. I didn't know why, um, but I would always find an unlocked door. If you try enough doors around the church, sometimes someone would leave one open. So I'm getting close to my high school graduation. We do the whole ceremony, we do the whole big thing, and uh, I'm kind of freaking out. I'm like, what am I going to do with my, with my life? What's, the, what's, the, what's my purpose? What's the point of even existing? It was a question I was dealing with. And my school did this like, project graduation party thing where you go to the high school at like 10 o'clock at night and they'd lock the doors. They'd have all these fun games and prizes. Like kids won like TVs and stuff. It was kind of cool. But you'd stay there till like 4 a.m. in the morning. So you'd be up all night. And the idea was you'd be locked in the school. You wouldn't go party and do something stupid. And then you'd be super tired. So you just you'd go home in the next morning. Well, I didn't go home the next morning um, because I was still just freaking out. I was like, what am I going to do if I go home? All of it is real. Like, I have to know what I'm going to do. I have to know, I have to have purpose. I have to figure it out. And I was just so afraid that even my college plans was just checking off a box. I didn't really know why I was doing it. And so instead of going home, because I just couldn't imagine being there, I, I went to this pond that I used to run around. I had like a trail. I'd run around as a kid. And I just kind of sat down at the shore and... Uh, Actually, I fell asleep. <laughs> it was like 4 or 5 a.m. at this point. And I just passed out there. I think I was thinking something. I don't know. I remember waking up to the feeling of like the, the, the water kind of brushing up on me. And, and I looked at myself. It was kind of like muddy. and tried to wipe off some of the mud. It was, it was nasty. And uh, it was Sunday morning now at like 6 a.m. or something. And I still didn't want to go home because I was still just so in denial and so afraid that that would mean I have to know what I'm going to do. So instead of going home, I decided I would go to this church that I knew, well, it wasn't too far away, but it was Sunday, so I knew better. I was like, I'm not going to go to the big room, because a bunch of people are going to start showing up, and they're going to talk to me or something. And so I found this little room off to the side, and I thought, it's probably not that important, just a couple chairs, a little picture of Jesus, no big deal. And uh, so I go into this room, I find some chairs off in the front, and I just kind of lay down, just think about stuff, and I fall asleep again. And I remember the feeling of this, like, hand kind of, like, gently trying to wake me up. And I looked up and just saw this like elderly woman just beaming, smiling at me. And I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, I'll, I'll go, I'll go. She's like, no, no, stay. I was like, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be here. I shouldn't be here. Like, please don't call the cops. You know, because she probably, I mean, I probably like this homeless kid who just wandered in here. And, uh, and she's like, I don't know, she's maybe 70 or 80. She, was, she seemed very, very old. And she was like, no, please stay. Please stay. And, and over the next 20 minutes or so, she told me that she was actually the, the director of their prayer ministry in this little meaningless room I had wandered into was actually their prayer room. I, I didn't know that there were 
rooms just for prayer in the church at the time. And, um, and it was so incredible because she began to tell me this, this message I'd never really heard before, or at least never heard the way that she shared it, was, you know, there's this, there's this God and he loves you and, and Jesus cares for you and he has a purpose for you, he has a plan for you, Scott, and that, and that he's okay, he's not afraid of all of your mess. He wants to bring healing in your life, and, and he wants to redeem and restore everything that is shattered. And I was just so blown away and taken aback by this message and honestly kind of freaked out because it was, it's uncomfortable to know that someone can love you that much. You feel almost undeserving at times. And I, I remember telling her thank you, and, and, that, and that was kind of it as far as she knows. She doesn't get to see the fact that, you know, years later I would, I would become a pastor and a church planter. Um, but, but that conversation with her, that meeting with her, set me on a path and on a journey that began my process of asking more questions, learning about Jesus, ultimately becoming a follower of Christ, all because this woman was willing to share with me about this love that God has for each and every one of us, this incredible goodness like we just sang about. And so this morning, as we look at a passage where, where Jesus really revealed and exposed to everyone for the first time one of his main core principles, his mission for why he came, I'm really excited because I want to integrate and also tell you a little bit about how I'm going to try to integrate Lake Avenue, this church plant that we're starting, and how Lake Avenue is going to participate and join with the mission of Jesus here in Pueblo. And so we're going to be in this really cool passage where Jesus, he's, he's back in his hometown. So he's in Nazareth. He's coming through. It's on the Sabbath. And he's, he shows up at church, you know, like this, the synagogue, basically. And uh, he's handed the scroll of Isaiah, the same scroll of Isaiah we have now. And he flips to a specific passage. It was a prophecy, hundreds of years old. It was, it was told from the perspective of the Messiah who would come. And as he finishes reading it, he says, today, the scripture is fulfilled. Today, everything you've been waiting for, all of the promises of, this, of this, uh, this, this scripture, all of the promises of this prophecy are in effect now. It all begins now, which is so, so exciting. Everything that people have been waiting for, everyone who knew this prophecy, it starts today. And so as we begin to read through these few verses, these short, short passages that Jesus shared at the synagogue thousand years ago, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Today, this scripture is fulfilled. So if you'll turn with me to Isaiah chapter 61. If you don't have a Bible, you can take out your phone, Google IS61. That'll work too. And it'll also be on the screens behind me as well. So Isaiah chapter 61. We're going to start in verse 1, and we're just doing three verses. But man, it's got some good stuff. Isaiah 61 verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, splendid clothes instead of despair, and they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify him. Today, the scripture is fulfilled. Every one of these promises, Jesus says, goes into effect now. We have this. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is for you. If you're not a follower of Jesus or someone you love isn't a follower of Jesus, be excited because today the scripture is fulfilled. Jesus has come. And this needs to impact and affect everything that we do as followers of Christ and how we share the gospel and why we share the gospel. Our first point this morning is really simple here. The poor and brokenhearted are seen by Jesus. The poor and brokenhearted are seen by Jesus. And it's, it's such a cool thing. You see, guys, Jesus wasn't walking around Jerusalem in the country looking. It wasn't like the NFL draft. You know, he wasn't looking for the 0.1% of the 1% best Christians. He wasn't looking for the five-star candidate, the blue-chip Christian who has everything together. Everything Jesus did was to demonstrate how accessible he was 
to anyone and everyone. I mean, the dude rode in to Jerusalem on a donkey. When other, other men would ride in on chariots and stallions to show off how grandiose, how great they are. Jesus took a donkey. I mean, even, even a woman could reach out and touch the hem of his cloak. Children could run to him. He spent time even with lepers. Every single thing Jesus did was to demonstrate that anyone can come to him. All are welcome. You could be caught in the literal act of sin, like a woman who was caught in the middle of adultery, brought before Jesus, and after a brief conversation, he says to her, is there no one left to condemn you? Then neither do I. Jesus is for the brokenhearted. He sees you. But it's so much more than just the way we see each other right now. It's not just that he, he sees you visibly. It's that he sees your need. He sees your hurt. He sees what's broken. And guys, I love it. Back in verse 2, he says right there, uh, no, before verse 2, the second line says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has a purpose. He doesn't just see your pain. He doesn't just see your hurt, but he has an intention to bind up to heal, to restore all that was shattered and bring it together again. This is so beautiful and so encouraging to me. You see, no one is too far gone. No one is too broken. No one is too deep in sin or hurt or anguish or anything for Jesus Christ. This should be so exciting to us because there is nothing you can do to be too far from the, 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 the reach of Jesus' grace and love for you. There is no person that you could care about who's too trapped and stuck in sin that Jesus can't change and heal. But also there's a flip side to that coin. Every bit as exciting as that is for us, there's also a challenge with that. You see, if no one is too far gone, then no one is off limits. There is not a single person you will ever meet on this planet who does not deserve the opportunity to hear about the good news of Jesus. You don't get to decide. We don't get to say, yeah, God, anyone but that guy. Anyone but her. You don't know what she's done. Yes, he does. A couple weeks ago, I was over at the Walmart on Southside, over um, off Northern, and I was just like shopping for pens, um, and I was, looking, I was looking at some pens. And uh, as I was there, I, um, I ran to this, this woman who I believe was homeless. Um, she's, her clothes didn't look quite clean or right, and this expression on her face just kind of indicated something wasn't 100% there. But here's the thing. Before I saw her, I smelled her. She had this distinct odor that was emanating from her, even from a distance. I, I, it caught me off guard, interrupted what I was doing, and I noticed her. And, I, as, and ironically, she came onto my left and was also looking at pens. And for the moment that she was next to me, it began to cross in my mind, like, should I say something to her? I, I don't know. What should I, should I ask if she's okay? What should I do? And before I could really even think to do anything, she, she had left, and, um, and I, it just kind of left in my head. And so I, I continued to look at pens. But even, even though she had left maybe half a minute or so, her odor still hung in the air. The smell was still there. It was so distinctive and heavy. And I began to wonder to myself, would this woman be welcomed at Lake Avenue? This church plant that I'm trying to start, will it be a place where anyone can truly come in, but not just walk in, not just seen, but cared for? People invest and say, hey, how are you doing? I don't just see you sitting over there. I'm going to come and get into your life. Would she be welcome here? Or would she just be off to the side and we would keep our distance because that odor is so uncomfortable? No one is off limits. You see, Christians, we don't have the luxury to hold a grudge. We don't get to say, yeah, God, I'll forgive everyone but that person. They're not worth it. You don't know how much they've hurt and you don't know what they've done to me. We don't get to do that. No one is off limits, which also is really encouraging, but can also be really challenging as well. But, but people, need to, people need to hear this. People need to hear the gospel, especially the poor, the brokenhearted, the marginalized, the ignored, the forgotten. You see, Pueblo has so many incredible people. 
And are we really reaching out to them? Or are we just staying in our bubble? Are we taking this good news to them that Jesus cares for them, that they're seen, they're cared about? They're not just some shadow. They're not just a number on the side of the road. They're not just another loud voice arguing in the kitchen and you, you know, when you're putting your trash out saying, God, it ain't me. Got to get involved. We've got to take this message to them. And, and what better way to do it than what Jesus established for us. Take a look at this verse. It's Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go. He's telling his disciples, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. So what do you think that looks like if a couple Christians get together and they say, hey, let's make some more Christians. And as we're making more Christians, let's teach them how to make more Christians. And let's baptize people, you know, like, like we do here in church. And you get a whole bunch of Christians trying to make more Christians. They're all baptizing, trying to talk and teach and more and teach, teach more and more about God. Guys, you're making a church. You see, statistically, church plants are filled with like 80% of the congregation are brand new believers. Church plants are reaching more and more new people because it's just, the, it's just like they have nobody. And so they're like, well, let's go talk to that guy on the curb. And he comes in. He's like, man, Jesus is great. I got to go tell my five buddies on the curb. And they all keep coming in. Our church plants are reaching tons and tons of people. And, we, and they also invigorate all of our other churches. And they need the support of healthy, stabilized churches. And we all work together. It's a great kingdom movement. It's a cool team effort that we get to do. And what an effective, incredible way to take the gospel to communities that desperately need to hear it. Here's our next point this morning. See, Jesus has even more. The captives of sin are freed by Jesus. The captives of sin are freed by Jesus. Now, this one seems pretty straightforward, right? Like we see it right there in the verse. Um, to proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners. Like, oh, and that sounds great. You know, like we get that, people are free, no big deal. But I want to take a moment and let's make it a little more personal. Let's make it more tangible. When you look at those, when you look at that verse right there on the screen, right there in your words, take out the word captive, take out the word prisoner, whatever your Bible has there, and replace it with the name of someone you love, maybe a friend or a family member who, who just seems to be stuck and caught in the stranglehold of sin, who seems to be captured by this cycle of constantly making horrible choices or bad choices which hurt themselves or hurt the ones that they love. And you see that and you think about that and imagine what would happen if tomorrow morning they woke up and all of that was gone. They were totally free from the bondage of the sin that it has them in such a grip. Imagine how incredible that would be. Put your own name there, whatever you're struggling with. Imagine if you knew and you had it for sure. If you don't know this already, imagine if you had all of the, the chains of whatever is holding you back from experiencing the fullness of Christ entirely gone. This is what Jesus has come for, to free the captives of sin. You know, I mean this in all respect. There's a lot of sin in Colorado. And there's a lot of sin in Pueblo. There's this old saying that poverty is the mother of all evil. And I get it, right? Wherever there's poverty, there's frustration, there's pain, there's desperation. And honestly, I kind of, I kind of think that if I, or maybe any of us, were exposed to such extreme circumstances for long enough, we might also make some decisions that might surprise us. I've been trying to think, how is Lake Avenue going to engage in this aspect of Jesus' mission, to free the captives of sin? And so I've been looking and researching more about Pueblo, and I've been looking up statistics, and, and Pueblo ranks pretty high in a lot of different things. Um, unfortunately, some of these things are crime. Um, some of these things are uh, one of the highest rates for divorce in the state. Some of these things are being one of the most unsafe cities in the country. But these aren't things that Christians run away from. No, these, are, these types of things are things that Christians go to their knees in prayer for, praying to an epic God who can do epic things through those prayers, and we run toward it. We run toward the hurt. We run toward the pain. We run toward the anguish, the desperation, the frustration, and we bring the good news of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus came to free the captives of 
sin. We can't avoid these things. We pray and we respond. And I think to myself, the times that I've met more difficult people, more challenging circumstances, and I'm listening to them, I'm trying to give them the truth, I'm trying to tell them, and they, it just seems like I'm hitting a brick wall, and all I can feel is this, if only you knew, if only you knew how good, how great, how magic, how like wonderful and marvelous the love of God is, you would be totally transformed. If only you knew. Have you felt that burden for broken people in your life? Have you felt the weight of that? You see, our churches must be prepared to fight for their souls. Jesus fought in this way that he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He went and died in our place. That's an incredible act of self-sacrifice and grace and love. And it gets even better than that. I love what happens right here. If you read, it says to proclaim the year of Jubilee or the year of the Lord's favorites in verse 2. There was this Jewish custom that the year of Jubilee would take place once every 50 years. And I didn't know anything about this, so I looked it up. I'm trying to Google it. I'm like, oh, what is this all about? Once every 50 years, the whole concept of this year was this year of rest, essentially. That was the whole idea. But what would happen is if you were a slave, you were freed no matter what. If you were leasing out your land or your property to maybe make some money to pay some bills, it could all be given back to you because here's one of the coolest things. Every debt that you owed, no matter how small or how big, was totally wiped away. All of your debts were forgiven. It was complete forgiveness of debts. You could start the new year with a blank slate, brand new. No matter how bad of a hole you got yourself into, when the year of Jubilee came, wiped away. You could start the new year brand new. And Jesus says, I'm here to proclaim the year of the Jubilee is now. The year of God's favor is now. No matter what the depth of your sin might be, no matter how much you've gotten into a mess or hurt or pain, I am here. You can come to me. The year of God's favor is upon you. It starts today. The scripture is fulfilled. All can come. Debts wiped away. It's so beautiful. It's so encouraging. But Christians, we know what happens in that second verse too. Right? It follows it right there. It says, in the day of our Lord's vengeance. Guys, we can't wait. You cannot wait any longer. We have, the, it's the year of God's favor, but we don't know how long it's going to last. The day of God's vengeance is coming. Time is running out. Do you feel that sense of urgency? There are people that I love who are not followers of Christ, and it terrifies me to think that another day has gone by, that they don't know Jesus the way I know him, the way hopefully you know him. The day of vengeance is coming. Do not tarry. Don't make our brothers and sisters in Christ wait a day longer. Take the good news to them. Share this with them. You know, we're, as a church, as Christians, we're in a very real war. A war against Satan and, and the powers of evil that seek to steal, lie, cheat, and destroy and kill everything that we love. And like any war effort, the front lines need to be supplied with weapons. They're not guns, not bombs, but love, self-sacrificing love, prayer, and the message of Jesus Christ through the gospel. Guys, we can no longer live like unbelievers. We can't use our time and our money and our resources like someone who doesn't know God. We have to be willing to make sacrifices to fund the war effort because the whole world needs to hear this. As of right now, there are at least... Two billion people on this planet who have never even heard the name of Jesus. Countless billions more who don't want anything to do with him. But two billion who've never even had the chance to hear about him. I think I can sacrifice a coffee here and there to support the ministries in the world afar and even here in Pueblo. And so when I think about why we move, so many people said, Scott, why would you move from Highlands Ranch? This is like the, you know, the Disney world of Colorado. Everything is great. And I admit it, our life was really comfortable. Everyone had really nice cars and 
the HOA didn't like me, but <laughs> whatever. Um, everyone had great property values and all this stuff, and, and we had a soccer team, and we had friends, and Marion had a, a, a school she worked at she could pretty much walk to. But I can't afford to live my life in comfort and ease. And frankly, because God is so good, it's been phenomenal living here in Pueblo. We've made great, great friends already. But it is a shift. Um, I never should have joined next door. <laughs> I keep seeing all this stuff, and I'm like, Woo! you know, I've been learning a little bit more about Bessemer, um, and I was like, well, hold up, Nate didn't mention that. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> you know, even a couple, uh, about a week ago or so, I was mowing the lawn over at the church, and I, I saw something kind of like, like a bright orange looking thing over by the building, so I walked over to it, and I found like a, uh, a needle that I'm guessing probably wasn't for a flu shot. <laughs> There's people doing some hard drugs over at our church, and I want them to know this truth. I want them to know the goodness of God, that they can be freed from all of the things that seem to bind them to their pain, bind them to their substance abuse, whatever it may be, they can be freed from it. And I believe it. I hope you do too. Jesus came to free the captives of sin. But if I were you, I'd still be wondering something right now. I'd be wondering, well, you know what, Scott? It's great that Jesus sees and cares. That's cool. It's really cool that he even does this cool work and is welcome to everyone. He can come and be saved. That's a great thing too. But what good is it if we're unchanged and we just keep going back in the same circle of mistakes over and over? And that's why I love this next part. Our last point this morning, the captives, I'm sorry, not the captives of sin. The, uh, we are given a new identity by Jesus. We're given a new identity by Jesus. You see, when you experience, when you encounter Jesus, you are transformed. There is no other option. I want to read this, uh, these verses again at the end because they're just so poetic and really beautiful and truly encouraging. It begins with, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of of mourning, in splendid clothes instead of despair. And they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify him. When you get to see Jesus, when you get to learn him, when you get to fall in love with him, when you get to meet him and know him the way he wants you to know him, you cannot leave unchanged. You cannot remain the same. And it's the greatest thing ever because while he asks everything from you, he does something so crazy and gives you back 10 times more. He gives you himself and access to the infinite strength of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has the power he is capable of taking, I love this right here, your hurt, your sadness, and trading it for praise and for joy. These are things beyond me. These are things that words cannot do alone. These are things that only our Jesus can do. And it changes us. It transforms us. It's a new identity. He even goes so far as to say we're called trees of righteousness. But you know, I want to, I want to remind us because this message isn't just for unbelievers, it's for believers too. You know, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. We need to remind ourselves of the gospel. It's still saving us today. I love that when Jesus comes, he says, behold, I'm making all things new. And new can be scary, I get it. But Jesus promises good. And when he was on the cross, he yelled out to tell us die. You know, it is finished. It is the year of favor. All can come to me. The debt is paid in full. You owe nothing. There is no guilt you need to carry for something you feel like you've done wrong and God can't love you for it. There is nothing you need to carry that makes you feel like you're weird or awkward or you're on the fringe. You're not part of the cool kids. Guess what? Jesus came for you too. He loves you. This is transformative. This is your new identity. No longer do you need to sulk and think, man, if only I could X, Y, Z. You are loved. It's the year of favor. You can come to him. I love what Paul says in Romans 8. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Nothing to fear. 
And don't just hold on to this message. This is, us. this is for us to share. This is so great. This is such good news. And remember how I mentioned at the end, and they will be called righteous trees or trees of righteousness. I love the imagery of being called a tree. It's kind of fun because trees grow. Trees can grow. Every time you come to church, every time you're praying with a friend, every time you're listening to sermons, every time you're working in the acts of ministry, you are growing stronger and stronger. And I know there's wind, I know there's rain, I know there's storms come, and it can feel like you're bending and about to break, but trees grow. I've seen horrible fires ravage Colorado, and I've been able to go in with the first responders because I was doing video, and it's the most beautiful thing that comes from ashes. It's, it's black everywhere in soot. And then you can see these almost little, almost little sparks of green. Almost maybe even little tree buds coming out of the ash. Not even days sooner than that. God, behold, I am making all things new. Trees grow. And I love this other encouragement for the believer. In Jeremiah chapter 7 or 17, Jeremiah also talks about being, tree, being like a tree. Listen to this. For the person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is the Lord, is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by water. It sends its roots out toward a stream. It doesn't fear when the heat comes, it, and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. As I get it, some hard stuff comes. Being a Christian means that you're willing to love someone else who might not want anything to do with you more than you love yourself. It can be hard. Choosing to say, I trust you, God, when nothing makes sense can be hard. It can feel like a year of drought, but those roots go to a stream, a stream of living water. That's where our life comes from. When you're connected to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, you access the infinite reservoir of God's strength. There is great hope for you, my friends. Whatever God has called you to, whatever God has brought into your life, be like this tree planted by a stream connected to the Spirit of God, which brings living water and transformation that nothing I could ever say or do will. I can, I can yell, I can be excited, I can show a, a movie that brings you to tears. It doesn't matter. That doesn't transform you. That just moves your feelings. This is, this is for real. This is the power that only God can bring. This is the transformation that we want to see in our lives. This is the transformation that I'm praying for in Bessemer. I want to believe in impossible things because my God routinely does impossible things. I've been keeping a screenshots of all the negative things people say about Pueblo and how dangerous it is. And it just seems so, so crazy to me that this could even be real when people describe these gunshots or, or these stabbings or these thefts or the things that people say about how, how cruel they can be. And it's, it almost seems ridiculous, and I, I'm praying for the day when it becomes so ridiculous that that was ever a part of Bethlehem, that, that things are so transformed, there's so much hope, and there's so much saturation of the gospel, and so much of the goodness of God, that people are like, how could that have ever been this place? How could that have ever been the same place? How could it ever be like that? Because it's so good now. It's everything that people have wanted it to be. I want to be part of what God is already doing I want to learn the dreams that people have in that community and how the gospel can help connect them to go even beyond what they think is possible. I want to hear about the hurt and tell them that Jesus has come to bind up the brokenhearted, to, to collect the shattered pieces. Guys, I want to share with y'all my dream for this, this, this new church plant. I dream to be standing on a Sunday morning and, and just praising and worshiping God with, with 100 believers. In this vacant space right now, it doesn't even have carpet. I dream of a church that is not just trying to be a church for itself, but a church that is so invested in children that, the, that they see how loved they are, how special they are. I dream of seeing a church that is continuing to focus on leadership and developing and equipping people to use the gifts that God has given them so they can be excited to start ministries that meet tangible needs in Bessemer. I want to see someone helping kids read. I want to see someone helping kids go to college or trade school or whatever it is that God's put on their heart. I want to see leaders is excited who love this city, who, who want to know how to take God's word all over the city and plant more churches. I want to see a day where in Pueblo, 
all the Christians increase and every church rises together where every one of us can proclaim the name of Jesus even louder than we ever thought possible. Where we're running out of chairs in the city because Sunday morning there's so many people going to church. I dream of a day where there's a million believers in Pueblo and across southern Colorado. Guys, let's make heaven crowded. Don't make our future brothers and sisters in Christ wait any longer. Take the mission of Jesus to heart. Join him. And let's see this place transformed unlike anything we've ever seen or believed before. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for sending Jesus that he would come and care about the broken, the hurt, the lonely, the ones who aren't strong enough to impress the world and what the world standards may be. God, thank you for giving a voice to the voiceless, for not just seeing, but caring and actively making a difference in the hurt in our lives. Thank you for having the power to do something about it, to proclaim the year of your favor and welcoming and inviting everyone into your presence. Jesus, that's me. That's so many of us in here right now. We know the truth. Your Holy Spirit showed it to us, the depth of our need. And Jesus, I am so excited to see more churches and more Christians all across Pueblo taking this gospel truth to people who need it. The hard places, the dangerous places, the scary places, your light can push out all darkness. We believe this to be true. Incite us, empower us, encourage us that no one is off limits. Let that be a challenge and an empowering statement for ourselves. For you, nothing is impossible. God, please use Steel City. Please use all of us to take this gospel to every single person that we love, every single person that you died for, and to see the captives of sin freed and transformed by your gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray.